September 480 BC had a chilly morning. The Athenian-led naval waited patiently for a powerful Persian armada to approach the island of Salamis. Each guy understood that losing the upcoming war was not an option, even being significantly outnumbered. Greece's future rested on them. However, combat preparations were underway early morning elsewhere than Salamis. Another crucial conflict was going to take place far to the west on the island of Sicily, the conflict of Himera. One of the Sicilian war's most significant fights was that one. The Battle of Himera took on legendary dimensions as the years went by. Some Greeks even said that it had taken place on the same day as one of the legendary battles of Thermopylae and Salamis that resulted in the defeat of the Persian invasion of Greece both in 480 BC. And two of the most well-known occasions in Greek history. Nevertheless, Himera has long been a mystery for such a significant conflict. The conflict was described in antiquity by the 5th century BC Herodotus and the 1st century BC Diodorus Siculus, the Sicilian, wrote history with partiality confusion and omissions. But archaeology is starting to alter things. Stefano Vassallo of the Palermo Archaeological Superintendency has been conducting excavations at the ancient Himera site for the past 10 years. His research has clarified historical descriptions of the conflict, helped determine its exact site and uncovered fresh information about the fighting and death of classical Greek warriors. Thus in 483 BC, a large portion of Sicily was divided between two power blocks. To the east and south were Gelo and Theron while to the north and west were Carthage and its allies. Prior to this relations between the two blocks had been largely friendly notwithstanding sporadic, isolated territorial problems. For instance in 580 BC Greek immigrants had the audacity to try to establish a village near Lilibium on the western edge of Sicily. The Carthaginians would have none of it so they launched an immediate assault and routed the expedition. Another expedition that was headed by a royal Spartan named Darius. The brother of the renowned Leonidas had a similar goal of establishing a town in western Sicily inside the Punic realm was defeated by the Carthaginians 70 years later. Although each of these events may have ruffled a few patriotic tresses a full-scale conflict never looked conceivable. They had no idea that it was rapidly approaching in 483 BC. Himera was one of the several towns that made up the Carthaginian sphere. Himera was a little Greek colony with a long history perched atop a rocky cliff. Initially founded in the middle of the 7th century BC the city thrived over the following 150 years as its citizens built strong relationships with both the Carthaginians and the local Sicilians, who lived in the vicinity of the Greek colony. Himera and its harbor attracted Greek, Punic, and other traders traveling the Mediterranean in quest of profit since it was located close to the mouth of its eponymous river. Even though it was a tiny city Himera had grown to be one of the richest on the island by the beginning of the 5th century BC. Himera may be summed up in three words, small, affluent, and international. Himera was taken over by Tyrillus a despot in 485 BC. Tyrillus' history and rise to power are not well documented but we do know what he did to try to maintain his recently earned grasp over the city. Assuring himself the strongest possible alliance with Gelo's adversary Anaxilus, he first wed his daughter. But more crucially Tyrillus also became close friends with Hamilcar, the head of the Magonids, the most influential family in Carthage. In doing so Tyrillus pinned his mast with Punic colors tying his city to the Carthaginian power block that now extended the entire length of Sicily's northern shore. Tyrillus had excellent reason to surround himself with such formidable supporters since he also possessed a formidable foe as Theron. 
For Tarilla's siding with Anaxilas and Carthage was the ideal deterrent to Theron's union with Gilo. Theron was unaffected by this though. Tarillus was overthrown and driven from the city by the Himerans in 483 BC who were assisted by Theron's army. Theron took authority in the void of power that resulted. Himera now had a new ruler. The consequences would be far-reaching. Tarillus cried out for help. After being expelled from his city he turned to his friends for help in regaining his strength. Both Anaxilas and Hamilcar in Carthage answered the appeal right away because they saw a chance to increase their own influence in Sicily. All-out war had been ignited by Theron's acts. Hamilcar amassed an enormous army and traveled to Sicily because he felt honor-bound to restore Tarillus. Despite the fact that Acragas was on the coast closest to Carthage Hamilcar decided against sailing to Salinas and then attacking it. Instead the Carthaginian fleet headed to Panormus while being accompanied by 60 triremes. Hamilcar presumably picked this path since his main goal was to restore Terralus. His obligation as Terralus' guest companion came before the conquest of Sicily. Storms at sea pummeled the expedition, causing it to lose ships transporting chariots and horses, which would be crucial in the next fight. The 200-ship Greek navy did not object to the passage and did not participate in the ensuing fight. Theodorus Siculus claimed that the Punic army had 300,000 soldiers, although this number appears to have been greatly exaggerated and was probably closer to 50 to 60,000. Its core group was made up of experienced mercenaries from the western Mediterranean region including Iberians from Spain, Ligurians from northern Italy and Libyans from Africa. Africa provided the army's primary units. Armed with long spears and round shields and donning helmets and linen cuirasses the heavy African infantry battled in tight formation. A tiny shield and javelins were equipped with the light Libyan troops. The Iberian infantry which battled in a close-knit phalanx and wore purple-bordered white tunics and leather helmets, was armed with long body shields, short thrusting swords, and heavy javelins. Despite frequently receiving equipment from Carthage, Sardinian and Gallic troops generally fought in their national clothing. The Libyans, inhabitants of Carthage, and Libyo-Phoenicians offered a well-trained disciplined cavalry armed with thrusting spears and round shields. Gauls and Iberians also contributed cavalry which was based on the full-throttle charge. The majority of the powerful, Four-horse war chariots for Carthage were also supplied by Libya.
A well-trained, battle-tested army was available to Gelo and Theron. Their armies were supplemented by hired mercenaries from sick elves and Greeks in addition to civilians. The severity of the situation is shown by the fact that Gelo borrowed money from the populace to pay for his military operations. It's possible that the estimate of 50,000 foot soldiers and 5,000 horses in the Syracusan army at Himera is exaggerated. Theron's army is unknown in terms of size. The inhabitants of the Greek cities of Sicily made up the majority of the hoplite force. Hoplite mercenaries hired from Sicily, Italy and possibly mainland Greece supplemented them. Some of the people worked as peltasts as well and the richer people made up the cavalry regiments. The army included sick elves and Sikan warriors. Archers, slingers and cavalry were supplied by mercenaries. Enormous Hamilcar spent three days rearranging his troops and mending his broken ship. The fleet followed the Carthaginians as they marched to Himera and camped close to the city. The Greeks did not obstruct Carthaginian activities even though Theron and his army were already in Himera. Hamilcar's troops quickly attained their objective. They set up two camps, one near the sea for the navy and the other farther inland towards the city west of the city where they anchored the large warships. Hamilcar assembled his finest warriors and marched them towards the gates of Himera, laying the challenge before Theron and the defenders after fortifying both camps with wooden walls. Theron and the Himerans accepted the challenge and marched out of town. The consequence was disaster outnumbered and outclassed the Himeran citizen militia proved no match for Hamilcar's troops and suffered greatly. The battered and broken remnants of the garrison fled to the relative safety of Himera. Morale was low, Theron realized he couldn't match with Hamilcar's strength on his own, making him far from the great savior the Himerans had imagined him to be. He needed assistance. Fortunately, he had one man he could turn to. Gelo had been watching happenings at Himera from 100 kilometers away. Knowing his comrade was in jeopardy, he promptly reacted to Theron's plea for help and gathered a strong army for the impending battle. The ruler of Syracuse marched his troops to Himera. Gelo and his army marched quickly, arriving at Himera in September 480 BC. Himeran hearts rose as this relief group approached the beleaguered defenders. They now had a chance. Gelo was no stranger to conflict. Gelo learned, after fortifying his position to the east of Himera, that numerous Punic soldiers were dispersed across the city's countryside, likely gathering supplies. Gelo noticed an opening. He gathered all his cavalry, 5,000 horses, according to Diodorus and ordered them to sweep the region, catching the Punic pillagers off guard. The end outcome was a resounding success. When they saw large numbers of cavalry charging at them, several of these isolated Carthaginian forces chose to surrender. Gelo's troop returned with 10,000 Punic prisoners, according to Timaeus, a patriotic Siciliote Greek writer. This figure is most likely exaggerated, yet the narrative might be true, first blood to Gelo. Gelo's little triumph gave the Himerans renewed optimism and he still had one more card to play.
Bomb square formation! Quickly now! Weapons ready! Theodorus claims that spies from Jelen's camp seized a letter from an envoy requesting to Salinas send horsemen to restore the casualties he had sustained at sea and send it to Hamilcar. Gillo gave orders for some of his cavalry to pose as Hamilcar's approaching comrades. They would use deception to get into Hamilcar's coastal camp, where they would then wreak havoc. The trick succeeded. The camouflaged Greek horsemen rode up to the Carthaginian encampment before daylight when unwary sentries let them in. Gillo saw that the time had come to go on the offensive once the cavalry announced their success. He gathered his troops and gave the command to advance into a large plain close to the Punic army camp farther inland. Moving in the direction of the Carthaginian land camp the Greeks marched around the southernmost point of Himera. Theron remained in Himera with his troops. Unaware of the threat the officers of Hamilcar reacted by sending their battle-hardened soldiers out to meet Gelo on the open field. The Carthaginian army dispersed from its camp and gathered atop the hill forcing the Greeks to engage in an uphill conflict. Gelo gave the advance command. His hoplites advanced slowly toward the Carthaginian line in close phalanx formations. The lines finally closed after what must have felt like an eternity and a brutal melee battle broke out in the confined space. The Battle of Himera had started. The conflict raged on for hours shifting back and forth all day. Both the Greeks and the Carthaginians sacrificed all to win with spear and shield. Both sides were aware of the treasure that awaited the victor and the death that awaited the loser. No progress had been made by mid-afternoon despite the fact that both sides had already endured tremendous hardship. But in the early evening, the crucial time finally arrived.
The drained troops then noticed smoke coming from the coast. As their friends appeared to turn against them, chaos erupted across the Carthaginian naval camp. Half-awake soldiers were mesmerized by Syracusan spears and beached Punic ships were lit on fire. Still things got worse. Hamilcar, who Gallo had also learned via the letter was at the naval camp that day for a sacrifice was discovered by the horsemen and killed in the subsequent mayhem. On the Sicilian coast lay the dead body of the man that many thought would return to Carthage before a triumphant Punic army. Many worn-out troops in the Punic battle line reached their breaking point when they learned that their friends had died, their ships had been destroyed and their general had passed away. Deeply discouraged, vast numbers of men turned and fled. The disorder quickly spread across the Punic lines, and in little time at all the whole army was fleeing back toward their camp and the few ships that were still intact. Which represented their last chance to leave the island, which had turned into a mass cemetery for so many of their co-workers. The Carthaginian line was destroyed. Come on! 
Gillow's troops were instructed to take no captives when they pursued their adversary into the Punic camp. But their focus was swiftly diverted by something else. Since they thought they had already won several of Gelo's warriors started robbing the camp of its war booty. Their chase abruptly stopped which was a fatal mistake. Some of Hamilcar's Iberian soldiers armed with hefty javelins and razor-sharp slicing swords, welcomed this reprieve and saw this as their chance to exact retribution. Regrouping, they launched a counterattack against Gelo's soldiers within the camp taking advantage of their avarice. The Iberians quickly grabbed the upper hand by devastatingly employing their lethal falcatas within the small walls of the camp. Gelo's troops were cut down by their resurgent opponent because they were disorganized and preoccupied leaving them all alone. Maybe the fight wasn't finished after all. Theron and his troops had been attentively observing the battle in Himera. Gelo committed his men to the battle after realizing that his army was in jeopardy of being defeated. At this pivotal moment Theron sallied out from Himera and appeared behind the Iberians, who had been making a comeback up until that point. The Iberians fled when they saw they were surrounded on two sides. Day had been saved by Theron. After surviving the Iberian storm, Gelo's troops carried out their ruthless instructions and butchered everyone who was in their way. Ships were damaged and destroyed and men were massacred everywhere. Only a small number of individuals who had embarked on the trip with Hamilcar from Carthage ever returned, telling their kin that all who crossed over to Sicily have perished. The great Carthaginian expedition was not to make a successful return. Gillo had achieved an overwhelming and total win. Near the location of the ancient Greek colony of Himera archaeologists discovered more than 10,000 graves in 2008 while working on a railway expansion. The bones of warriors from the 5th century BC were found in some of those burials. Researchers point out that DNA analysis revealed that the warriors who took part in the second battle were mercenaries from as far away as present-day Latvia and Ukraine. Sicily had calm after the conflict. Himera was Theron's when he practically gained it with a spear, while the remaining parts of the island that belonged to Carthage originally remained under Punic rule. However they were required to provide Gelo a compensation of 2,000 silver talents. The victorious party also gave Anaxilas in Regium permission to retain rule over his little but crucial realm. Tyrillus who vanishes from our records after the conflict, was ultimately the Sicilian tyrant who suffered the greatest losses. 
Prosperity for the winners was one outcome of Himera, notably for Theron's Akragas, which subsequently began its golden age. In addition to considerably boosting the city's economic might thanks to the massive number of Punic slaves obtained from the Battle of Himera. The conquest of Himera and its thriving port soon brought in abundant benefits. Using the captured slaves and loot, Gelo and Theron constructed public structures like the Temple of Victory. Theron maintained authority over Himera up until his dying in 472 BC, eight years later. Following 480 BC, Gelo and his Syracusan realm also experienced prosperity. Before his demise in 478 BC the tyrant oversaw the further inland extension of Syracuse's dominion over the following two years. Due to Gelo Syracuse had begun to evolve into the greatest polis in the west, a position it would soon hold for more than 200 years and was no longer overshadowed by other Greek cities in eastern Sicily.